Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Salted Hash. My name is Steve Reagan, Senior Staff Writer at CSO Online. Today I'm joined by Famita Rashid, and we're going to talk about the DJI bug bounty fiasco and uh, sharing your home cameras with local police. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Like I said, thanks for joining us. Uh, again, Famita, how are you? It's been a long time. No see? <laughs> I'm doing really well. Good to be back. And, you know, likewise, I miss you. <laughs> I miss you, too. I'm glad you're here, though. Uh, we had we had some things happen here recently. Um, you and I were talking about this the other day, the bug bounty fiasco at DJI. Um, tell me a little bit about it. Well... I mean, the simplest version is company releases bug bounty. Company doesn't really realize what a bug bounty is. When a security researcher tried to report a vulnerability, the company reacts, shall we say, in a not pleasant manner. And then the security researcher, to his credit, decided, you know what, I don't have to take this. He walked away from the money. He publicized what the issues were, not just the vulnerability itself, but his basic point was, company, you can't do this, which I thought was the most important part of the story, that we are getting to the point where researchers are able to say, we are coming to you in good faith. We expect you to engage with us in good faith. We need some rules. It's no longer the wild, woolly, wild west. And I like that. Yeah. Uh, from from a company standpoint, a PR relationship nightmare could have been avoided in so many ways. Yeah, that the the, the whole meltdown about. It. I think uh, one one point that Kevin wrote about when he disclosed this entire, uh, uh, I guess we could call it a situation slash uh, expedition into the world of how not to do a bug bounty. The um, the the interesting was when they came back with that that contract, it almost you know violated his freedom of speech. There was a lot of personal issues he had with it. In the end, he walked away from uh, what was it, a thirty thousand dollar bounty. I mean, he just something like that. I mean, it was definitely a larger number. You know, it's not like a chump chain. It's yeah. not a t shirt and a hat saying I found a bug. Mm -hmm. This was a significant amount of money. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, I I, I don't know. I think. How they handled it was was one thing, but I think the 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 larger root problem is a lot of a lot of companies seem to have jumped on the the bug bounty bandwagon and they're offering it they're offering one to the public because that seems to be the thing to do. Let's just have a but not yeah. realizing the work and effort and time that goes into such a thing. Um, exactly. I mean, there's always been a question where people think bug bounties are penetration testing. Oh, yeah, you know, they're going to poke around and they're going to tell us what's wrong. Yep. But that's really not quite it. Um, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of just groundwork that needs to be laid. It's not a one time engagement. You're yep. not dealing with one person. And I guess in that big hype, in that jump for the bug, bug, bug bounty, people kind of forgot that. Yep. Which is sad because it's not like the bug bounty folks have not said you have to do it. That's always been the case. Make sure you can support a bounty. Yeah. And I, I think another thing is the fact that, you know, the, kind of touching on your, your one and done thing is once something is reported, you have to be willing to fix it. And I've heard reports of companies that get these, you know, these reports, but nothing changes, which yeah. defeats the entire purpose of the, the program anyway. So that that's always confused me. But um, so you're creating a backlog, but as long as you don't fix it, you don't have to pay it. So what is the point of knowing about the vulnerabilities? Right. right. I mean, it, it, it's it's befuddling, to be completely honest. Like, I, I don't. And, and this has been, we're going on five years now to where bug bounties are a thing, right? I, or has it been longer? Yeah, I'd say so. But, I mean, we're, we're getting to the point now to where it's almost commonplace. And that's a good thing. You know, I, I yeah. like to see researchers rewarded for their work and their effort. But I also think that it's still new. There's there's plenty of growth to be had. And um, there there have been some some really large, notable progressions in this space. The Pentagon bug bounty comes to mind. Um, exactly. Katie Mazuris had a, uh, yeah. a lot to do with that, you know, and I think there's good value in that right there. And I'm glad to see the government stepping up in that regard. Uh, what was another really big bug bounty? Um, 
Tesla. I mean, pretty much. I mean, Tesla has it, and then you have like security companies also having Hacker One or Bug Crowd do yep. bug bounty. So when you have security companies saying, "Hey, yeah, we acknowledge we have issues. We want you to help us fix it," it normalizes it even more. It's yeah. no longer just, "Oh, I'm clueless. I need help." It's like everybody wants to make everything better. Yep. So moving on from that topic, the other thing that we were going to talk about, it, this came to me in uh, just one of my random pitches. I get hundreds of pitches a day and I skim through them all, but occasionally some of them really catch my attention and make me think. And I'm going to read to you a, a quote that came from this pitch. Every day there are countless news reports using footage from surveillance cameras to help detect, identify, and apprehend suspected criminals. Video surveillance function, uh, functionalities and security technologies in both residential and commercial settings are continuously evolving. From facial recognition capabilities to auto-zoom and tracking, these features can go a long way in supporting local law enforcement investigations. Now, that quote comes from Angela White, who is the president of the Electronic Security Association. And what they want to do is take your home security systems and tie them into a, a, a type of program that allows local law enforcement to check your cameras in the event that something's happened in your area. And at first glance, you're like, hey, that's a really good idea. You know, I, I have the security system from my ISP. You know, it's a part of their, their ADT program or what have you. And my camera is constantly recording from my driveway out into the road. So if local law enforcement needs to investigate something, they can pull that footage. They can see it. And I was like, that's great. And then I thought, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why am I going to give my camera footage to just anybody? And how is this going to be secured and, and controlled? And Do we really trust somebody else right. to have a centralized database of every video? Right. I mean, talk about painting a target on the back. Well, not only that, the, the first thing that came to my mind was that, um, that television show um, from a couple of years ago, Person of Interest where the rogue NSA agents like tapping in all the cameras and visual stuff from around the city so you can track and find people. And I'm like, yeah, it, again, my gut reaction was this is a great thing for law enforcement. I, I could see why this would be beneficial and then totally flip to how it could be abused. <laughs> but what do you think about that? I mean, do you think it's wise to, to plug these systems in together and, and I guess expand your visible footprint or is it something that should be hands off? I don't agree with the entire idea of a central repository. Um, law enforcement already go to house to house and say, hey, do you have a security footage? Can we take a look at it? There was a crime, we're looking for footage. That already exists. Yes, for the law enforcement, it would be really easy if it was in one place, they type in the address and they get everyone's footage right away. But I'm not comfortable with the idea of all that in one place. And I'm not mm -hmm. even saying rogue police. No. It's just the fact that if I and, you know, maybe NSA is listening, this is just a hypothetical. Um, if I decide I want to plan an attack, the first thing I'm going to do is get into the database of this video thing. Yeah. So it's just a another way that we're making attack crime easier. And I don't really think it's necessary at this point. Yeah, I'm in agreement with you totally. I like the idea of helping law enforcement, but at the same time, when they're canvassing an area, the, they're asking about security footage anyway. And if I have it available, yeah. of course, I'm going to exactly. You know, give yeah, it to I them. mean, stores already provide their yeah. footage. You know, um, like in my neighborhood, ATMs it happens. And... People do it all the time. I mm -hmm. just don't see the necessity for the police to skip asking me and just take it anyway. Well, see, in my neighborhood, we also have the the cameras that are mounted on the. Um, uh, the telephone poles and the spot shotter, shot spotter rather, uh, system exactly. is around there as well. So, I mean, yeah. there's there's all, all kinds of footage they can pull from. But my big fear, like along with you, is this is a central repository of all these cameras and all these feeds, yeah. and yeah. I, I can just see that as being you know something that could be attacked. And yet, I I really do agree with with what the uh, the ESA is going for here. I understand. You know the need to have this type of availability. It, it only, it only helps. But at the same time, you know, again, we're talking about the fact that when police go out and they're interviewing everybody in the area, what did you see? What exactly. did you hear? Hey, do you have any security cameras? I know there's a camera facing this road here. Can I get the footage? Yeah. I mean, it's just standard, you know, standard questioning. 
So, I wonder even about like the basic privacy laws. I mean, you know, I have young kids in my home. Mm -hmm. If there's suddenly a database where my footage, which I'm capturing, is there and there's no protection for the minor, I'm not even quite sure if this kind of a system even fits in without any kind of scrubbing, any kind of even like a protected, like, okay, if you have footage of a child, it has to be separate from everything else. Like, there seem to be just so many other privacy violations. Yep. And I mean, I'm sure you know, my camera, they track a lot of other things. It's not just, okay, images, okay, when you were turned on, who is doing what. Yep. That's just a lot of metadata right there that, you know, it's not just footage. There's just a lot of other things associated with it. Yeah, and it wasn't really clear in the, the pitch of the press release as to, you know, how this data is going to be sanitized, if any stored yeah. and secured it's just more announcing the program and trying to get get the word out there some more law uh, law enforcement agencies sign up and you know get people to 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 basically you know join yeah. up and help out which again i understand it i think what the esa is going for here is is very you know very I think Possibly. implementation is also a big part, too. Yeah. Um, you know, as a homeowner, if I have someone coming to me and saying, hey, this neighborhood, we all pull our footage into this place so that we can help the police. Don't you want to help the police? Yeah. I'm going to have a really hard time being, wait, is this mandatory or do I have yeah. to, like, it's going to be hard to do that. And the the thing is, the more this this you know, spreads, that is going to be the, the whole situation is nobody wants to be the one that says, no, I don't want to help law enforcement. And suddenly <laughs> you're, you're dumping your footage in with everybody else. Or if it becomes mainstream and it really takes off, what will happen is you'll get a firmware update to your camera and it's automatically linked. It yeah. just goes. In which case, you know, you're, you're completely taken out of the equation. So there's nothing you can say or do about this anyway. So, but yeah, I, I just, I figured I'd run it by you. I mean, I like, I like the concept, but I think it's really going to depend on how it's it's implemented, and I, the whole central location for all this footage just scares me. Yeah, it just scares my wits. So, I've done a couple of um, shoots today, and I had some people in the studio earlier, and I asked them a, a question. I'm going to ask you, and I, I right. I'm doing it because I I figured getting your your take would be kind of fun. So there's been a lot of stuff going on in security this year. There's been a lot of good things and a lot of bad things. But <laughs> you think? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and here, I'm going to let's do some 2018 predictions. I got one for you. Somebody somewhere is going to get hacked. There you go. That's 2018. <laughs> it's going to happen. Mark my words. You can hold me to that. Here's so, the counter prediction. Someone somewhere is going to suddenly find out their PII, their financial data is all been stolen. See, look at that. She's got to one up me every time every time. So considering everything that, that's happened this year, what is the one thing security wise that's really gotten your attention that you've either looked at and was like, oh, cool, this is really neat or, oh, oh God, why is this happening? What's wrong with you? What are you thinking? What, what is your one thing in security that stood out this year? Wow. You don't ask the easy question, do you? <laughs> <laughs> um... I would have to say, and I really, really hate doing this because it feels like a dodge, but I would have to say that the fact that people who never cared about security are suddenly now talking about two-factor authentication. Wow. Whether, yes. whether that's because, you know, G Google is pushing it so hard or because as soon as x -Fact came out, Everybody is on the radio and TV saying, turn on two-factor, turn on two-factor, or NIT saying, don't use SMS. Like, whatever it is, I just feel like that becomes a word people know. Like, you talk to people, go, oh, do you have two-factor? It's no longer, huh, what are you talking about? I'm like, not kidding. It. You are the second person to give me that almost identical answer. <laughs> and, and the thing is, it, it's completely valid. In fact, I agree with it. It was one of the things that I really picked out. It's a lot of people are... are you know, starting to understand that authentication is important, your passwords are important, your personal information is important, this needs to be protected. So uh, along with two-factor, my other thing was, you know, password managers. People are starting to use them now, yeah. and I really, really like that. I yeah. love that we have these these shifts to where now people care about their their passwords. They care about how things are, are getting authenticated. And honestly, I think Equifax has really been the the catalyst for that. When that that became public, I think people really understood now that this isn't 
Target and your credit card that your bank will yeah. replace tomorrow morning. This is your history. Your life is now gone. And exactly. despite what everybody's seen in the media, nobody knows what happened to that information or where it is. Yeah. It, nobody's seen it on the dark net. It's not being openly flaunted or traded. Nobody's bragging about it. It's not been leaked. We know it was compromised, but we don't know what, if anything, we, we don't know what's happened with it. Right. Which means for millions and millions and millions of people, that's going to be a constant cloud hanging over their head. Yeah, it's like every time you get your credit card bill, you're looking, there is that question in my head. Is this the bill where I'm going to see some weird charges? Is this when I'm going to start seeing the impact? Yep. And the not knowing, you don't even know when you can relax and stop worrying about it. Yep. Random question. Have you ever like reported a security incident on your credit card because you saw a charge that you actually made but forgot about it and it freaked you out? Yes. It actually happened right after the chip and uh, chip and sign card came out, which was the yep. weird thing. You know, the entire point was EMV was supposed to prevent um, card not present fraud. But um, so that rolled out October, not last year, the year before. 15 or, or 16, yeah. Yeah. And then like two months later, I get a credit card bill. I'm looking at it. There's a charge to the San Francisco Marriott. And I'm looking at it. I'm saying, but I wasn't in San Francisco. So I called a Marriott and they said, well, you signed, you checked in. And I'm saying, no, I can prove to you that I was not in San Francisco. And they said, okay. And I mean, they just did whatever they revoked it i never saw anything afterward i kind of mm. called back and i was like can you tell me what happened because as a reporter i'm curious yeah <laughs> <laughs> but they never gave me the story but it was very much like i've reported fraud fraudulent transaction i've never had to the point where my entire identity was stolen although i've seen people who had to do the police report and all that i mean i've been lucky i just call tell them that's not me and they reversed the charge almost right away yeah, I felt really bad when it happened to me. This was a couple of weeks ago. I had called, and I'm like, this charge wasn't me. I need to to get this reported. And they they ran the transaction down. Um, this is uh, my bank. And they came back, and they're like, um, Mr. Reagan, we saw the receipt. This is actually you. I'm like, really? When was I there? Well, apparently on this date. They're like, oh, oops. I'm sorry, but they were so reactive to it. Like they, they, it, they, they ran it down and the, the security guy I was talking to on the phone, you know, he goes, you know, I understand it happened. You forgot, but I, I want you to, to walk away with at least you checked your statements. People are, are, don't really do that enough and it's starting to change. And that stood out to me. It's starting to change. People are paying attention now. Right. And I, again, I, I honestly think, you know, Equifax was the catalyst for that because it impacted so many people. And I think it was also not just the impact. It's that half the people were like, wait, I've never heard of this company. And I was impacted. You know, like with everything else, it was like, okay, the, all right, fine, I'll stop using them. Or, oh, okay, I'll stop shopping there. Or, you know, just kind of shrug and say, what can I do? But we suddenly have a company most people have never interacted directly with. Yeah, and, and it knows impacted. everything about you. That's the thing. You've never directly in, in like interacted with them and yet they have everything that's ever known about you and exactly. for a lot of people i think that generally scared them to a degree because unless you've been denied credit you've never actually seen equifax on a on a, on a thing i mean exactly. you know me my credit sucks so i see them all the time and they're they're a con a constant taunting reminder that <laughs> you get nothing <laughs> and, and it, it I mean, I know what Equifax is. Obviously, in the space, too, we're familiar with them because we have to cover data brokers all the time. Yeah. But seeing one get popped, that was just mind-blowing. Just mind-blowing. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't think... I don't think the full impact and see this is another one. If I if I really did had to make a 2018 prediction, I would say the full impact of the Equifax data breach might be discovered <laughs> next year because I don't think we've seen it. I yeah. think we know how many, roughly how many people were hit. I think we know how it happened, why it right. happened. And I think there's some lesson, lessons learned from the management and infrastructure side of it. But I don't think we know the full scope yet. And I don't think yeah. we've seen the full cost or impact of this breach either on, on Equifax themselves. I think we're going to see 
more of I that. I think cost is something we're just going to see for years and years. Gonna, mm-hmm. It's not just like lawsuits. We're going to start seeing people acting differently. There's going to be changes in how people do business, how people do sh- their consumer spending. There's going to be a ton of different small but significant changes, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, Famino, it's good having you on. Thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I'm going to have to have you back on when I, I shoot the next series, uh, <laughs> probably after the first year. So expect yeah. me to, to pester you. Yeah, it's always <laughs> good to get it. It's always good to keep us humble by having both of us on the camera at the same time. I think it's probably easiest, the best video I'm going to shoot all day. It's, it's going to be fun. <laughs> I, I, I look forward to these chats. So Yes. For the rest of you watching, thank you for joining us. Again, my name is Steve Reagan with CSO Online, and this has been Salted Hash. I'll see you next week. Thank you.